So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Friday's Talk Photography session. And I am very pleased to welcome to us all the way from Paris, Paris, France. I don't know why I say Paris, France, but there is a Paris, Texas. So, but I know you're in Paris, France. Uh, Joe, great to have you with us. How are you? I'm good. Thanks, Jay. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. I know we've been chatting in the van, so it always seems a bit fake when I say, how are you? But um, absolutely uh, thrilled to have you with us today. And um, I think it's really uh, great over the last couple of weeks, those of you that may have been on uh, the webinar program with us. Um, we've been seeing over the last few weeks ways photography have um, been used um, in, in more than just the portraiture and the wedding. And, and obviously, photography has been such a massive part, well, probably the part of your project to, to take it to what it is uh, today, Joe. Am I, is that fair? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. That was an amazing tool for me to, to connect with so many women and, and share their, their experiences and stories, really. Brilliant. I mean, just over the last couple of weeks, I think I was telling you the other day when we, we met for the first time, we know we've had photojournalists on sharing. We, we had one chap with us um, who's who's literally been a photojournalist in South Africa all the way through apartheid and going out of it, you know. And um, and But it's it's the this, these, this kind of photography, journalism, yourself, with these very specific projects, where photography can be such a powerful uh, tool, if you like, uh, and an awareness to, to bring these uh, to bring these important things out to the open and to, to new audiences and to, to new thinking, I guess, on that. I, I, there's me doing your presentation for you, Joe, so I'm <laughs> sorry about that. So, um, guys, um, Joe's going to probably, uh, we've chatted about the presentation, so Joe's going to fill you in fully uh, on how it came about, um, how it what you know what it is, and and how it's worked, and it's a really really interesting session. I'm looking forward to. So remember, guys, we're going to do the questions at the end of Joe's presentation. So please pop them in the question panel. So anything that she talks about, we'll we'll recap it all for you and ask you your questions at the end, so we don't break uh, Joe's flow on that. Joe, so if you're ready, I'm going to pass you the screen. Yep, perfect. So it should be prompting you now. Yeah, here. Can yeah. you see my screen? Yeah, I've got you in, uh, or I did. There we go. I think it's going into full. It's just going into full screen. I think. Yeah, let me know there when it's go. good to go. I've got you. We've got you in full screen mode. I can hear you nice and loud and clear. Feel free to talk to me at any point, Joe, if you need to, and I'll let you know if anything goes wrong. But all good at the minute. It's all yours, darling. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Jay. So hi, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. I hope everyone is well. Uh, obviously, Jay gave a bit of an introduction, but I think I would just um, tell you a bit more about me. What I like to do when I have to introduce myself in a presentation is that I like to use keywords that are meaningful to me, go through them and basically explain to you why they are so relevant and, and, and meaningful to me. Um, so you know by now, my name is Johanna, I'm 31, I'm French, uh, as you can probably tell by the accent. Um, I was born in Paris and I've been living in London for about eight years now. So I basically came to London to complete my master's in marketing, which makes me a marketeer. Um, I'm currently working in a big tech company and uh, I am mixed race. So my mother is West African, she's from Benin and Togo, and my dad was Italian and Polish. The reason why I'm giving you these four elements is quite simple. Um, being born in Paris and living in London means that I've been growing and evolving in two of the most multicultural cities in Europe. This really shaped the way I saw, but also how I see the world now. Um, and it really kind of helped me nurture my creativity and shape the way I'm working on creative projects. In addition to that, so as I said, I am a mixed race. And this is something that to me is quite important to mention because as a collective group, I don't want to speak to all the mixed race people in the world, but um, I've spoken with uh, enough mixed race people to, to understand that as a collective group, we tend to struggle um, navigating our cultural, our multiple cultural identities. Um, so the sense of belonging is not something that is a given to us simply because most of the time people we kind of question your belonging to one community or the other. This uh, difficulty, I would say, is something that really um, encourages us to uh, put ourselves in other people's shoes and trying to understand other people. Because our uh, own situation as mixed race people is quite 
misunderstood. We understand that it's also a role to um, open up to the others, uh, to others, and really try to understand their own experiences and and the difficulties that they are facing. And this is definitely something that is important when you're working in marketing as well simply because you are obviously targeting a very diverse range of audiences and you need to share a message with these audiences. So you need to understand their experiences, their stories, their habits, their, their experience um, and basically their behavior to make sure that you can reach them in the best way. So all of these, all of these four elements really shaped the way um, I created my projects and I'm going to um, go through um, how all of this happened. So in terms of the Celtic project, so the Celtic project is a um, is something that I like to define as a portfolio of experiences for curly haired women. So I created this in 2017. Um, and what I'm doing basically is interviewing and photographing as many curly haired women as possible, women from all parts of life. So um, whether it's about the social background, the age range, um, the cultural and ethnic backgrounds, all of these elements. Um, and I'm really um, interviewing them, taking the portraits and really trying to understand via their own experiences, the link between natural hair and the notions of identity, femininity, race, diversity, and representation. Obviously, the question of beauty standards comes out quite a lot during the conversations that I have with these women, simply because on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, what you're gonna see in the media, on TV, in magazines is, I mean, it's changing now, obviously, luckily, uh, and hopefully it will stay that, I mean, it will continue to evolve. But generally what you see is one particular type of profile. Generally, the woman is white, uh, she's a blonde or a brunette, but most importantly, she has straight hair. This really leads um, women with curly hair, and more particularly women of color, to um, internalize this subtle message of, you know, it's almost like understanding that if you're not represented, it's maybe because you're not worthy of being represented. So you kind of internalize these very subtle messages um, that really have an impact on your self-esteem from a very, very young age. So what in what's interesting with the stories of the Caltech project is that they're all very similar because we all have curl to, curl, um, curly hair, so this is a common trait that we all have, but also very different. As I mentioned, I'm interviewing women from all parts of life, and you need to understand that, for example, if I interview a curly haired woman who is a black, dark skinned with very coily hair, her experience will be very different from a white blonde woman who has loose curls, simply because the black woman's experience will be very deeply rooted um, in the impact of, for example, slavery, colonialism, but also racism as we know it today. So the experience are kind of similar because there is a common trait that is textured hair, but also very different simply because we are all different. So our hair are different. Um, you have different textures within the curly hair spectrum. You have obviously different skin tones when it comes to the women that I'm interviewing. So in regards to the stories, some of them will be very heavy on pride and, and unconditional love when it comes to their natural hair. While some will be more focused on struggle and misunderstanding when it comes to the relationship these women have created when it comes to their natural hair. So now let's talk about the purpose. Um, very often, not always, but very often, and this is specifically, um, this can specifically be applied to women of color, very often textured hair will be a clear representation of your cultural background and ancestry. Um, from a very young age, when you have curly hair, you will hear things like your hair is different, it's unmanageable, it's unpresentable, um, it's bushy, it's messy, um, and this can come from a very diverse range of sources. It can come from family members um, who will, you know, use very hard words like your your hair is, as I said, messy, bushy. You you won't be able to find a job. You won't be able to find a, a husband with hair like this. This kind of stuff. It can also be applied to the corporate world. Um, I myself had to experience very um, offensive behavior um, from colleagues in the past, um, whether it's um, something that is quite, I would see that as a, as a breach of, of, uh, of intimacy, if we can say it like that, like a colleague that you never spoke to coming to you and basically, you know, 
putting their hands on your hair and until they can reach your scalp actually um, this was a very very difficult thing for me to kind of handle but in addition to that you will simply hear things like okay you need to straighten your hair or wear a wig in order to go to these clients meeting or you need to wear a wig if you want this job which is very problematic because textured hair is simply something that is naturally growing out of a head so this shouldn't be questioned um, and obviously all of this puts a lot of pressure on on women so as i said it can be very subtle as much as it can be violent um, i remember this woman telling me for example that her textured hair was an issue um, in her love life because more than once she had to face men who would tell her that they would prefer to have a partner who has hair that they can uh, run the fingers through. This is a very subtle remark, but it says a lot about the way curly hair is perceived, especially when you are a woman of color. So it's all about making sure with this project that uh, we have the notion of representation at its core um, in order you know, for women to kind of feel represented, but also understand that they have a voice. And we will um, go through that later. So why did I decide to focus myself on hair? So um, this project was created out of frustration in regards to uh, obviously my own experience, uh, but also in regards to the natural hair movement. For those of you who don't know what the natural hair movement is, I will just give you a quick overview in a nutshell. This is a movement that's what's created um, over a bit over a decade ago in the US. Um, and this was a movement that basically encouraged black women to embrace the natural hair. Uh, so that it was a movement originally created for, for black women by black women. Since then, um, the movement got diversified a lot and you now have women from, you know, different cultural um, backgrounds um, and age ranges and everything. But why do we feel that, why did we feel the need to have a movement like that? Um, basically, what you need to understand is that for centuries, um, physical characteristics of black people and especially black women have been questioned and challenged like the skin tone the the the, the physical you know features the hair uh, always receiving this message that everything that black women or black people are isn't good enough so generations of women have been internalizing these messages and have been sharing them um, generation after generation after generation these lead to black women and i'm talking about black women because this is the community that i that i'm a part of and that i know uh, but for example it will lead black women but also communities like a lot of people in the asian community to uh, for example lighten the skin uh, due skin bleaching um which is obviously a very dangerous um dangerous and toxic techniques but in addition to that i'm talking about hair here i can talk about also uh, chemical relaxers Chemical relaxers are very, very toxic products. Um, a research last year in the UK have proven that chemical relaxers can be related to cancers, uh, but also fertility issues among women. So when I mean toxic, I mean really toxic. And the issue with that is that you um, grew up in communities where your hair isn't celebrated, where um, straight hair is, uh, instead, and that you basically use chemical relaxers to belong and fit in, um, and sometimes from a very early age. I personally started relaxing my hair uh, at 16. Um, I went natural at age 24, so my natural hair journey is still very uh, young, I would say. But I've interviewed women who told me that they had their hair relaxed from age four. If you consider the fact that chemical relaxers are extremely toxic, like I just said, you can understand why everything is so problematic. So the frustration related to the natural hair movement, even though it really helps me and helps a lot of black women to embrace the hair and to understand how, um, how it works basically and, and what it needs, um, the frustration was related to the fact that the natural hair movement was very focused on beauty. It was always about how to have juicy, bouncy and moisturized curls. But how about the experience related to that? I mentioned the microaggressions. I mentioned the discrimination when you're looking for a job. Uh, I mentioned the difficulties and the harsh uh, messages that your family members will share with you from a very, very young age, who, which are basically impacting your self-esteem from a very, very early stage of your life. So all of this was to me very frustrating. I was like, okay, there is a clear experience related to having curly hair. 
um, there is a baggage, an emotional baggage that comes with it, but no one is talking about it. So I thought, okay, let's create a platform where I will actually, um, you know, interview women, put their portraits out and make sure that their voices is heard simply because this angle has never been explored before really. So um, in terms of how I organized everything, I would say it was simply um, contacting women um, on social media, mostly on Instagram. Uh, Instagram has been amazing for that. Uh, contacting them on Instagram, inviting them to grab a coffee and having a clear discussion with them. So obviously I'm the interviewer, they are the interviewee, but because I am my own target audience, I know what the experience of having curly hair is, and as a woman of color as well, I'm able to relate and identify to the women that I'm interviewing. So it was very important for me to have a clear conversation instead of just having a very random Q and A um, and some kind of back and forth with them. So, um, and, then, and then basically we would just look for spots just after um, the coffee. I would generally arrive in advance um, before the, the women arrive to have a look at the area and see if there is any uh, colorful backgrounds. I'm really into colorful backgrounds. Um, and, um, and yeah, that's basically how it happens. And I think what kind of justified and validated um, the fact that I wanted to launch an initiative like that is the feedback of the women I interviewed. Um, many women basically got back to me after the interview and thanking me, simply telling me that this almost felt like therapy, simply because they never had a chance before to talk about their hair that way, using the hook of race, of representation, of femininity and of identity. As I said, the conversations around hair are very often um, focused on beauty. So I guess for women, it's quite important to explore it I would say even further and 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 engage a bit more with what it really means. Um, simply the fact that hair is much more than just hair. So why photography? So um, the first thing I would say is that photographies are portraits more particularly are amazing tools to tell stories. Um, I really do believe that by just looking at the portrait, you can understand what the person in front of you um, has been going through in, in, in her or his life. Um, and this is why I selected these two pictures um, today. Um, the first one um, shows Mohina with the pink lipstick. Um, she, we met in France, um, but she is born in Cameroon. Um, from, um, I mean, she's born in Cameroon, her parents are from Cameroon. So she's very, I would say, connected with her culture. She's always been. Um, her blackness and her Cameroon as ha Cameroonian background has never been questioned. Um, and her hair has never been questioned by her parents who really, really, you know, pushed her to embrace who she is and, and embrace the, the texture of her hair and her skin tone and everything. And I really do believe that this portrait of her is really showing this. I never had, at no point, had to guide her um, to take her portrait. I literally told her, okay, we're gonna take the picture here. She just came in front of the camera, chin up, facing the lens, and just making sure that she looks absolutely you know, fierce and proud and, and confident. And I think this is quite interesting because I really do believe that all the positive messages that she grew up with made her the woman that she is today. Interestingly, when she moved to France, she got destabilized, destabilized a bit. She was a bit disturbed um, simply because, you know, you spend most of your life in Africa, then you move to France and you don't see yourself represented anywhere. This to her was very, very complicated to manage. But somehow, because as I said, because she internalized so many positive messages from day one, this didn't impact her negatively that much. Um, and I really feel like you can see that in her portrait, like a fierce, confident woman who's firmly standing in her truth. On the other side, you have Laura, who is uh, an amazing girl that I met in Paris last year when I was there for the summer holidays. Um, and she is from um, the French Caribbean. She's from Martinique. Um, and she really struggled with uh, the comments 
um, of people um, comment on the way she looked, on her skin tone, on her um, on her on her hair, really on her on her texture, and she really struggled with it. And I really think that by looking at her portrait, you can see. And maybe I'm a bit biased because I know her story, but I think that you can see what she went through. I think you can really see the softness of her character and the, and her vulnerability as well. But you can also tell that she learned to outgrow all these negative messaging, uh, these negative messages that she has to internalize until she reached the point of self-love. So this is actually, this is one of my favorite pictures actually. But yeah, just to, yeah, tell you that I really do believe that photography is just an amazing tool to tell stories about the subject, um, which makes it an amazing, an amazing tool. In addition to that, I told you before that representation is at the core of the project. Um, and um, I am a firm believer that you can't be what you can't see. Um, you know, you can hear about people's stories, you can read people's stories, but until you actually see them, I do believe that it's quite difficult to relate to what they experience and to identify to them. And I think photography actually enables that. It's a way to tell to all these women that they are not alone in this process and that all the women, in addition to themselves, have a voice that they are able um, to share. Why photography again? Because you can repurpose the content again and again and again and again. Um, these pictures that I put on this slide are basically pictures that were taken during the different uh, events that I've organized for the project since its creation in 2017. So whether it's a photography exhibition um, or um, a panel event or conference, um, this kind of show you that with photography, you can simply create conversation. You can repurpose it. Obviously you can keep it in your room or put it on your website, but you can engage with people and create conversation. So I really do believe that photography is part of a, of a complete circle, I would say. Um, you engage with people, you take their portraits. From that, you can create even more conversation by organizing events and conferences. And following that, you can actually engage with the press who will talk about the project. Obviously, it's great in terms of self-promotion and it's great to raise your profile. But in addition to that, it's also a way to create even more conversation, attract more people, um, and, and generate more interest. So these are basically a few of the uh, press coverage that I secured since the creation of the project in 2017. And I think one of the best examples is this BBC News article that I had. Following this article, who was basically talking about the photography exhibition that I organized, um, it was last year for International Women's Day actually, um, I received tons of emails just about just from people who obviously wanted to be involved and share their stories as well, but also from people who just wanted to share the story. So it was really, truly a lot of emails telling me, hi, I found this BBC News article and thank you. And just sharing their story. I'm, I'm living in Wales, I'm having, I'm having curly hair, really struggle, blah, blah, blah. And I would just receive emails like this for days after this article went out. So this is to show you and to illustrate the fact that obviously you are creating content, but it's very important to be able to repurpose it simply because by repurposing it, you can create even more conversation and, and, and share the voices of the people who, um, who really need it, really. Now I'm going to go through a few key learnings um, that I, um, I would say had um, after the creation of the Curls of Project. Um, I would say that these are mostly based on the idea of challenging yourself. Um, I will tell you a bit about me. Um, I'll be very, um, I would say it will be a very personal thing for me to say, but um, I'm, I'm basically an introvert. I've been an introvert all my life. Um, which means, as I'm sure you all know, that I am kind of struggling to uh, go towards people. I'm struggling to, um, yeah, to generate, to create the interaction. I tend to wait for people to come to me, if that makes sense. But then you wake up one day and you think, okay, you want to create a project like that, and you set yourself the objective of interviewing 100 women. How do you do that when you are an introvert, when you don't like to go and speak to people openly? Well, again, as I said, it's all about challenging yourself. So I basically had to challenge myself a lot to um, just, yeah, 
contact people uh, on social media. Sometimes I would stop people in the streets to see if they would be interested, giving me a card. So this was, I would say, the first key learning when it comes to challenging myself. Um, being an introvert is something, but it doesn't mean that it should limit, um, I would say, your creative capabilities. The second one, I would say, is my English. I will explain you why. Um, so I've been in London for eight years. Um, and I basically, as I said, came to complete my master's uh, in comms marketing. And I started my career in PR. Um, and as soon as I started working PR, even though I was really good at what I, what I was doing, um, many people came to me and openly said that I would never succeed in this industry because of my written English. Uh, and this is something that really stayed with me. Um, it's, it's all about, um, it's a, really a question of choice. Like, do you listen to what people say about you, to you in your face, or do you try to, you know, do something about it? And it was very hard for me to feel that I had a legitimacy to create something like this because obviously I wanted to take the portrait, but I also wanted to retranscribe the interviews. And how can you do that if your written English is not that good, you know? So I kind of internalized this. Um, and it was really hard for me to accept that people were actually not giving me a chance. It was set in stone for them. I would never succeed in this industry because of my English, full stop. The project has been created in 2017. And to make sure that I would be understood by everyone, I basically worked on my English like crazy. Even though I was pretty good at school in France when I was um, when I was uh, in my English courses, but then you come to England and people say, oh, okay, I can't understand you, so it's a bit awkward. Um, so I basically yeah, read newspapers, books in English on a day-to-day -day basis, making sure that I'm listening to radio and everything, just to make sure that the, the content, the written content that I would share with the world would be understood. Created in 2017, I can see that a lot of people are identifying to the project, to the stories, um, they are able to relate. So I guess I succeeded to get there. Um, and to be honest, I'm now working in marketing and I'm doing good. So I'm absolutely fine now. But just, yeah, a, a little bit of a, of a push on this. Like people will always have, always have something to say about what you're doing and how you are doing and what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and this is something that I decided to change, to challenge myself a lot on, especially since the creation of the project. I would say the third challenge was, ironically, my use of a camera. Um, I never considered myself a photographer before. Um, I love to take pictures with my phone, but most of the time I'm using my phone to take pictures of palm trees and Parisian buildings when Paris is sunny. That's basically um, what I like to do with my phone when I'm taking pictures. So taking portraits was extremely new to me. And again, you think, okay, I need to create a project. I want to take pictures, like qualitative pictures, obviously and I don't know how to use a camera. And I'm basically panicking every single time I see a device with too many settings. So how, again, how do you do this? How do you make this happen with this kind of fear instilled in you? Luckily, I have a friend who is an amazing photographer, who's also my flatmate, um, who really encouraged me and I was able to borrow one of her cameras. Um, and it was really the first step towards the, the launch of, uh, of, the, of, of a successful project, really. So this really helped. And the latest challenge I want to talk to you about is the power of um, delegating to people. Okay, I'm going personal again. Um, I have been, I'm, I'm an only child. I've been raised by a single mother, which means that from day one, I've always had to learn how to uh, have fun by myself, how to entertain myself, how to find solutions by myself. So this instilled in me a very strong need for independence. Like I now know, thanks to this, that I'm an extremely independent person. Um, however, on the, I would say negative side, I also um, started to grow this mindset of, I can do everything myself. I don't need anyone. I'm a strong woman. I'm independent. Da, 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 da. It's good, but sometimes it's also very good to accept that people can help you. And this is something that I'm still learning to do, um, you know, learning to delegate. Since I created the project, I really struggled with letting go and accepting people, I would say, into my world when it comes to contributing to making the project grow. 
um, you know, since the creation of the project, I basically, again, did everything myself. I built the website myself. I interviewed and photographed the women by myself. I worked on the PR strategy, the social media strategy, um, the, 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 the events, the logistics, the comms, everything I've done myself from scratch. So it was very hard for me to consider opening up and letting go and having other people, yeah, welcomed into my world, I would say. But sometimes it has to happen. Um, and these pictures that I'm showing you are um, a proof of that. Um, these pictures are the result of a campaign I've been working on for months um, in partnership with a studio called Renaissance Studio. They are, they are based in Brixton. Um, they, I basically pitched um, an International Women's Day campaign to them. Um, they obviously had this pitching competition and they selected the idea. And I was like, okay, great. I'm going to have this International Women's Day that actually launched uh, last Monday, if you want to have a look. Um, I was like, okay, this project will be able to come to life and it's great. But then, you know, this old mindset of mine came back and I was like, okay, how do I open up to these people? How do I make sure that I'm, um, I would say, that I'm not mi micromanaging them? How do I make sure that my vision is understood by them? How do I make sure that they come up with ideas that are related to my ideas? How do I make sure, how do I make sure that, I am, that I have like some synergy around the entire project? And it was really difficult for me to accept the fact that for the first time in years since the creation, I wouldn't take the pictures myself. I wouldn't be the one controlling the whole thing. Obviously I was overseeing everything because it's my project, it's my campaign, it's my idea. But I wasn't the one taking the pictures. I wasn't the one, you know, playing with the light on set. Um, and it was very, very difficult for me to accept at first. And then obviously when the result is there and you understand that you have the ability to share what you want from the team and what you want you to accomplish, because it's a partnership, really. They are co-producers in this campaign. And, and it's been very, very um, refreshing for me to you know, work with people and understand that actually, Joe, it's okay to let go and to accept people's help. You know, it's like when people tell you that you're working in a cre on a creative thing or a business or whatever, and people are telling you, oh, keep it for yourself. Yes, you can. That's what I'm doing when I have job interviews. I, I keep it for myself until I have the job. But I've learned, thanks to this project, that you actually can say to people what you were doing. You would be surprised by the amount of support you will get by talking to people about what you are about to create. Um, so yeah, I would say this was another way of challenging myself, opening up, making sure that I'm um, happy to welcome people into my curl talk world and, and, and making magic like this campaign. Like these guys have been doing an amazing job um, and, and I'm really, really um, happy about the results and I'm still excited to share a bit more, a bit more, um, a bit more content about this uh, later this month. Um, and I just realized that I didn't, didn't give you the context about this whole campaign. So as I told you, it's an International Women's Day campaign. Um, that I created simply because after all the interviews that I've done for the Curlfoot project, I realized that one of the reasons that, that makes women hate their natural hair um, is the lack of positive intergenerational communications within families when it comes to textured hair. You know, I told you before, uh, family members using terms like your hair is too hard, it's too, it's too, it's too difficult, it's too harsh, it's, it's not beautiful, it's too, it's too, whatever, and any negative, um, any, any, anything negative that you can think of. Um, and as I said, as a, from a very young age, you learn these things, you internalize this thing, you grow up having internalized these things, and you basically end up being a woman with very low self-esteem because of something that naturally grows out of your head. So this was, I would say, the, 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 the core of this new campaign uh, that I called Curl Generations. So, um, which means that obviously I involved mother and daughter duos, um, like they should be here and here. So different, different age ranges, backgrounds, etc. So yeah, these were the key learnings. Um, and it was, I think, a good way for me to conclude this presentation. Um, obviously, feel free to get in touch. 
um, you, uh, I will be looking for more women to involve in the project later this year. Uh, so feel free to you know, get in touch by Instagram, email, check the website. Uh, and if you have any questions, obviously I'm, I'm here to, to answer. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. I do have questions for you. So have a, have a drink if you've got one. Sit down for a bit and we'll start working through them for you. Um, <laughs> But I think for me, as we were chatting, uh, we've we've chatted over the last couple of days uh, because obviously, uh, you know, to get to know each other and just to show you how to work the webinar um, for us. But uh, what was uh, interesting for me and what was really resonated with me was that the project was your goal. And, you know, as you've just quite rightly told them, and I think you, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not doing this to embarrass you, but you said to me, Jay, you've got to remember, you know, photography has become my tool and I'm still learning. And I said, we, we all are, um, you know, in this conversation. And you was going, oh, if they ask me, those are techie stuff, you know, I, I use natural light and this, that and the other. But you can see, and it's hard, it's a short time to, to show um, the transition, but obviously I've had, it, and if they go and look at the magazine, I think that, I think even in your photography, Joe, you can see your journey in the, just in the few images that you've shared with us to, to promote. And you can see even in yourself that you've improved and you're learning, but I don't know if you could take it back for me quickly. The first shot that you showed of the, um, of the, the girl with the pink lipstick and then the, the, the other one, and this is hand on heart from me to you now, when I saw, because these are the images that I've used to um, promote the image, because it was the images that you shared with us um, to promote them, I absolutely was going to ask you, I can see exactly what you just said as an observer. I can see that the woman on the left is very confident, she, uh, and as much as the, 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 the lady on the right, she's, she's beautiful, but you can see that little element of, I think you, not self-doubt, but you can see it. Does that, like you said, and I think you did capture that, you were right to say that you've captured that. You can definitely see that she's on her journey of coming out of herself, whereas the, the lady on the left is obviously a bit stronger already. Uh, so you've done your job there. You've absolutely uh, done that. And um, and then those shots of the of, of your, of your, uh, event, you know, your, your documentary style shots, you can, see, it's just, you can just see, you can see the smiles, you can see the interactions. You've caught it brilliantly, Bev, honestly, we really, really have. So my, my, I salute you, honestly, I really, I really do. We, I think, I don't know if I, I was talking to you the other day, and, I, and it's important to share with our audience that are with us at the moment. Um, you know, you asked me, I think, what, what I knew about what you did. And I said, well, obviously, I've read your article. But prior to that, that's all I had done is read, read your article that you did first for the magazine. And I know you shared some of your, your recent articles with me. But we were discussing just yesterday how I remembered. And after when I went home last night after talking to you, I was telling you that I'd seen something on TV, was if you remember. I'd seen a documentary yeah. um, about hair, about, uh, about um, black people's hair. And then I remembered, obviously, we had, last year we had all of the, the Black Awareness television and uh, through those times. And I remembered it was, as I said to you in the conversation, it resonated me a story about a Rastafarian woman and a Rastafarian man. They were a couple um, and, and telling their story about the power and these things and the hair and, and, and their beliefs. Um, it, it, it resonated with me. I didn't watch it enough to really take it in, but I remembered them and I'm not going to forget them. And that's the likes of these projects, especially for the people that have taken part and the women that have taken part, um, is, you know, it, it is going to be with them forever. But, you, you know, you are creating awareness. Like you said, this hasn't been going for six months. It's been going since 2017. And you're growing it and you're expanding it and the awareness is growing. So um, anybody that does that, I think is amazing. I'm, I was saying to you about, we were talking to photojournalists just the week before last. And you know, some, there were some really hard hitting questions for the likes of them, Joe, as you can imagine, they, they were covering war and apartheid in South Africa, um, you know, so it's having to tell people stories and some of them quite harsh in different ways. Um, but, um, you know, photography can make a massive difference in people's lives. And the fact that you embraced it and it, and it, it, um, it challenged you 
and helped you come out of yourself, you know, is is brilliant. Um, the, the people online with us, and obviously you've only known me for 48 hours, but those are the people who've been with us and, you know, had Mark and me in their lives for the last 18 years with the Photographer Academy. You know, I can take a picture, Joe. I know I can take a picture. I'm not, you know, the open photographer. But when I do get that from Mark, that's a good image, Jay. I'm not going to lie that it doesn't feel good. Do you know what I mean? I don't get it very often because he's a bit of a hard taskmaster. But when he goes, that's a wicked image. And I know how I feel. So, And I then strive to make myself better. So I love the fact that the project came first. So when, when well, did it come first? That was the question that, I, uh, that somebody else asked first. Because you said, obviously, the photography had to come with it. Was the project there in mind? And then you thought, how am I going to, how am I going to, get these stories out there you you tell me how it worked for you no i really really wanted to have the pictures i mean the pictures were at the core of everything um i basically imagine i remember when i was thinking about what the website would look like i was literally Im uh, imagining a portfolio like literally uh, a, an amazing amount of portraits of very colorful portraits like that's how i saw things and then the interview aspect the the, the written aspect came about um because i felt like it was simply more complete you know some people just um would you know limit themselves to photography and be very happy and connect with the content straight away but some people actually feel the need to you know read the stories um to relate i would say so i thought okay let me do something that is obviously having the pictures at the core of it obviously this was something that i wasn't ready to compromise on uh, even though as i said before I, I wasn't really sure about how to use a camera or anything i knew that photography had to be at the core of the project and the writing had to come um, a bit later, but still associated with it, if that makes sense. No, it does. Because my, my question, when I thought about it afterwards, after talking to you yesterday, was when obviously you said that you went down the photography route, I wondered if there'd been a consideration to them to be like video interviews, so you're actually hearing their voices. Uh, was that ever in, in your mind, or, or, or was it always yeah, going to be? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. To be honest, since the creation of the project, I have a lot of ideas. Um, <laughs> and, and I think I'm... I'm I'm progressively making them happen. Like for example, the exhibition. I remember when I launched the project, I was like, oh, my dream would be to launch a photography exhibition. I've done it. And then I thought, okay, it would be great to have like a mother duo, a mother daughter duo uh, campaign, you know, to talk about this kind of intergenerational communication that I just mentioned before I completed the conversation. And now I made it happen. So it's, it's, it's uh it's just a matter of time like obviously video is very important and i would love to you know in the future organize another photography exhibition but that would include the video format that time um so again it's all about good timing resources as well and as i said opening up to other people and making sure that you are um letting go and, and accepting a bit more to, to contribute with other people because obviously you have a lot to teach to other people but you also have a lot to learn from them um and as i said you know i need sometimes to remind myself that yes i am independent yes i'm strong yes i can do things by myself but sometimes you know other people's skills are necessary to make you grow um and and it's and it's best to have this kind of mindset of collaboration so video is definitely on the map uh, it's just a matter of yeah, finding the right, I would say, the right time, the right resources, and the right people to work with on this. I, I was saying to you earlier that I, I reread the article uh, last night just to refresh myself uh, for today, and, and I loved, uh, and I'm going to share them whether you like it or not, but I'm sure you'll be happy with it. The last two questions in the article, the first one was, um, has anyone given you any advice that you found invaluable? And uh, straight away, it was your mum. Um, and told me never to believe anyone who questions my ability, um, and that made you who you are today. And you know, yeah, you know, we can, we should. Ho hopefully, a lot of us can resonate. I can absolutely resonate that with my with my mum and my dad. Uh, and then I liked uh, for a complete beginner in photography. Do you have any words of encouragement? I loved it. And the first two words, own it. I thought that was just so brilliant. People will always have something to say about you. And it's important to always remind yourself of your purpose. And you've, um, and I thought that was, you know, it, obviously knowing more about you now and your background as a marketeer, but, you know, you, you do come across as incredibly confident. And I've only been talking to you for the last 48 hours. Um, and, um, but, and you can, you can hear the passion for it, you know, in your voice. But I think, um, 
storytelling is is so important and photography is such a, a, an incredibly powerful tool uh, and video of course but you know being photographers and you know being around it and i, I think sorry just checking the question pal williams just asked but i think you've just kind of answered it and i kind of asked you for it so the project was the was the drive but you knew then the photography was going to be the the vessel is, is that right yeah yeah definitely yeah yeah and and you've as you've said you've pushed yourself i think the key thing is is that you gave yourself a very specific project you know you 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 knew of stories that needed to be told so you had and it, sometimes it's quite hard and we talk about within the academy and our members that to push yourselves to learn something new create your own personal projects we've been talking about it all the way through lockdown you know we've been encouraging people to record their lockdown life because everything is different you know everything has been different for all of us things are changing i mean me i've never read so many books joe you know I, I, and it was just like i've got the time now i should be like why have i bought all these books and i've never read them and some of the photographs that i've been taking personally to recall my lockdown life has been the books you know just piles of them going down from a big pile to a small pile um but i i there was i don't want to take the, the power or the emphasis of what you're doing. And I meant to say it to you yesterday. Um, Mark, as you know, who I work for and who I work with, he's really, really hard to buy for, right? So birthdays and Christmas come around. He loves photography, but you want to buy him a book and he's got it. Do you know what I mean? It, you know, it's it's one of those things. And he came back from Sweden, I think it was, from a, from teaching out there. And he went, yeah, I saw this incredible exhibition, this incredible photography exhibition while I was out there. And I've been trying to, I meant to ask him this morning uh, for the photographer's name, and I can't remember, it's killing me, but I'm going to find it uh, to, 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 sh to share on the Facebook. Um, so I went, I said to Debbie, his wife, I said, oh, he's been raving about this photographer. Should we see if we can get him a book for Christmas? And I Googled the guy and there was only one book from this person. And I just ordered it, Joe. I didn't know what the book was. I didn't. Um, and I hadn't, you know, didn't bother to do my work and research him in any way. I just ordered the book and gave it to him for his birthday. It was still wrapped. I hadn't opened it. And then on his birthday, he said, did you look at it? I said, no, it's still sealed. Look, you can see it's happening. And it was these beautiful portraits of black women in Africa. And that was my first thing when I was looking at the book. And then it was a, it was about a, a bit bigger than A4, a full portrait, landscape, uh, a portrait image on the one side, and then the person's story on the next page, like you're doing with Girl Talk. Um, these were all women that had been suffered um, mutilation at the hands of warlords and things in Africa. Mm. But when you looked at these images, Joe, and I'm sure it's something that you probably want to look at yourself now, the stories were so positive um, and the pictures were beautiful and you could see, you know, they. They, they were safe, they'd been saved, they're now protected, they're living their lives. And with the book came a documentary, on a DVD documentary. I broke, broke our hearts, but at the same time, at the end, it was beautiful because we knew that they were safe, these people. And we're, we were talking about hundreds of images, Joe. I mean, it wasn't a small book, you know, this, this, this photographer. Had, and this, I'm not saying his message helped, but it definitely helped. You know, he wasn't the only one behind this this purpose, but you know, the photography in that instance absolutely made a difference. Um, and that that is that is, you know, really important. So telling the stories, whatever um whatever your background is, whatever race you are, whatever it is. Um, you know, so as I said to you, I'm I'm not joking, I salute you and that's why I was thrilled to have you on on today and keep it going and keep talking to us. Keep you know, if we can help in any way uh with awareness and helping you with that and, you know if you come back on and in, in a year's time and tell us where we're at now you know i'd absolutely uh, love that for you there's there's actually coming through the panel now thank you for sharing um and inspirational and even if you know somebody picks up picks up the camera and just strives to be better but start telling stories you know, even if you're just telling them for yourselves you had a plan you've done it and you've had a goal and there's no reason why we can't do similar things. Tell your stories in your neighbourhoods. Tell your, tell your, you know, tell what's going on. And we've got, you know, our, I photographed, you know, the um, the families on the street, you know, at seven o'clock when we were all clapping, you know, from a distance, obviously. But just telling stories, you know, I know my neighbours, but do I really know them? You know, we could we could learn more about them, especially now we're allowed in the gardens again. I don't know why. You said you're you're quite free in Paris, but we're, we're getting we're getting released. 
slowly over here now so things are slowly getting back to normal um yeah no sorry joe i'm just reading the chat panel thank you for sharing your passion is is it shines through uh on that um no, have i missed any <laughs> so laura laura's online with us and she, she's put in the chat panel. Chat, she's put on the chat panel from one confident curly girl to another thank you <laughs> with a big kiss uh, on the end of that yeah now get back to work laura you should be working get off the webinar <laughs> joe thank you from me to you thank you so much for spending the time with us today i've, I've really enjoyed it and getting to know you over the last couple of days um and let's let's not leave it there let's uh, let's have you uh talking to us and keeping us posted especially you know when you get back to london um not that i'm a, a curly haired black person but you can buy me a coffee and interview me when we can get safe again i'd love to do that i bring my stepdaughter to london every few months when it's safe so i think she'd love to uh, as well because she's quite powerful positive about her photography and her art so uh, i'm sure you'd be quite an inspiration on her so uh, we'll try we'll see if we can make that happen when you're back uh on this side of the pond, as they say on that. Um, I'm just going to rob the screen back, Joe, just to do some reminders before we finish. But, uh, but there we go. So, uh, guys, as we said, uh, the links for Joe to get involved with her, get interact with her Instagram, her email, and our website are there. You can't really forget the Curl Talk project, but uh, I'll be following on Instagram just after we finish this. I meant to do it last night, but I, I forgot that on that. Um, and the links are in the chat panel, plus the email that you'll get from us tomorrow with the follow-ups. And of course, if you if you miss any of it, just get in touch with us at the Photographer Academy. And of course, we'll share those with you. And um, if you want to watch it back, then it will be on the Photographer Academy. It'll probably be uh, next week now. If I can get it converted, though, I might get it uh, up online this afternoon before I finish. And uh, as we said, um, Joe's article is in issue 46, I think it is. If you go look at the back issues, um, there's an there's one there, it's all about hair. So it's quite fitting that Joe's in that magazine. Um, so you can uh, find out more about the project and see the questions that we haven't scraped the surface for uh, in, in that article there from it. And as I said, you can download those for your mobile devices or to read online. This is the current issue. And as I said, they're all free. Get involved with us on Instagram to get yourself featured. So at TPA photo. Upgrade offer there again. All the links are in there, and then um, just to give you a heads up for next week, uh, the program for next week is Saturday morning on our YouTube channel on the Academy YouTube channel. Mark is continuing his Photoshop Live series. Uh, then at lunchtime, we're continuing our business series on commercial photography. That's a webinar at one o'clock. We have a photo critique also on Monday night for our members. Uh, if you're not a member, you can still watch, but if you do want to join up as a free member, you can submit images. Uh, they are sponsored by our trained partners. We don't, it's not a competition, but if you do uh, to become one of Mark's top five images of the night, you will get a free 20 by 16 print from one of our trade partners. On Wednesday, Mark will broadcast live from the studio again on the YouTube channel. Uh, we'll be live shooting. And then our landscape photographer, Nigel Foster, is back next Thursday at 11, continuing this landscape uh, series. But we're going to be looking at commercial and travel photography and specifically looking at how to photograph people in the landscape. Joe, again, from me to you, thank you so much for joining us today from Paris. And uh, um, I have loved having you on with us. We'll keep in touch. Guys, stay safe out there. I hope to have you all back on with us next week. Thanks again, Joe. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.